Okay, in this Boothbuster video, I want to talk a little bit about the bandpass filters that I have. I described in the last video the kind of overall architecture of the transmitter, but I'll focus, focus right now on what happens after the AD1 mixer. The AD1 mixer takes the, um, the, SS, the double sideband signal, the, well, actually the single sideband signal that's coming in from the second TIA, which is at around 5.2 megahertz, and mixes it with 9 megahertz signal, more or less, from the VFO. And that produces um, the sum and different, fre different frequencies that are the 75 meter and 20 meter signals. Now, the only thing I switch in, the, in this transmitter so far is, uh, the in terms of frequency, are the bandpass filters. So if, if, if I select one uh, side, I get 75 meter bandpass, the other side a 20 meter bandpass. Uh, I have one little relay in here that lets me, lets me do this from a front panel band switch. I would have used two relays to try to keep the inputs a little bit further away from the outputs, but at the time I only had one, um, one good relay, and so I, I tried with that. It seems to work. It seems to work fine. Um, I, how I designed the um, the two filters, I I started out using ELSI, E L S I E, a freeware program that you could download. Quite good. Um, and it, it'll design uh, filters for you quite nicely. You tell it, you know, what you want the center frequency to be, what you want the bandwidth to be, how much ripple you want, what you want the, Im the impedance on, both or on either end to be, and it'll spit out a filter for you. Um, and I did that um, for both 75 and 20. I started out thinking that I want a big, big, sharp filter because, you know, let's face it, I got 10... <laughs> 10 poles of the crystal filter. So I started out thinking maybe I'll do it with four, four LC circuits in the, um, uh, in the bandpass filters. That turned out to be a little bit too much. It's hard to, I think, to get a, uh, a four LC circuit bandpass filter working properly. Um, you're probably better off going with three or even two. You're also probably better off including some trimmer capacitors in there because even though LC and the RF tools software that I used are very reliable, when you actually build the device, it might be, it might have a bandpass that's a bit off from where you wanted it to be. You can't just blindly accept, expect that the filter is going to be where LC or RF tools predicted it would be. There's a lot of different variables in there. So I would, I would check the bandpass using the Nano VNA or the Antuino. I'd get a rough way to check it just by putting a signal generator in and watching on the scope and then tune the signal generator across the band and see if output increased where I wanted it to. Of course, you have to make sure that the things are terminated uh, with the right impedances. I have them terminated right now with a little um, 50 ohm um, a connector to the SMA uh, that, that came with uh, either the Nano VNA or probably came with the... Um, um, a tiny SA. But anyway, um, that's how I built the filters. And I, I discovered that I couldn't really use the standard Manhattan method because the pads that I was using was adding significant capacitance at places where that might affect the band pass or the, or the resonant frequency, the LC circuits. So I dispensed with the pads and you'll see I have the capacitors kind of floating, kind of dead bug style without actually being connected to a pad. That worked out okay. Um, I could probably still work some more on the on the uh, the bandpass filters. It's an important part of the rig, but they seem to be doing what they're supposed to be doing right now. Again, I recommend using the LC program, and I also found this website called RF Tools, rf-tools or rf-tools.com. I'll put the link up on, on the blog page. One of the problems with LC is it limits, on the free version, it, it limits how many circuits you can have in there. And I was bumping up against the limit with LC. So that when it came time to do the 20 meter filter, I, I switched over to RF tools. One of the other problems with LC and RF tools is that um, if you, you ask them to design you a filter without kind of an impedance transformation network at either side, they'll come up with a filter that's, uh, that's 50 ohms and has the band pass where you want it. But you might find that the coils that that calls for are 
kind of impracticably small. So you'll have really small coils that really are difficult to construct with the kind of toroidal cores that we use. So then you can go and you could say to these, to both these programs, hey, look, give me this filter with this bandpass, this bandwidth, um, uh, and but I want to use one microhenry coils. So then it'll go ahead and it'll design you the same filter with one microhenry coils, tell you what the values of the capacitors are, but you'll find that the the, the impedance of the filter then is no longer 50 ohms. But both programs will come to your rescue because they will offer you impedance matching networks for either side to match with whatever impedance you want on either side. And, and in most cases, that would be 50 ohms. So then you tell them, okay, I want this filter to be matched to 50 ohms. It'll offer you a number of options. And the one I, su su I, su uh, the one I selected was just a, a capacitive impedance or voltage dividing network on, on either side. And it'll tell you what values to use for the capacitor. So both these programs are really useful when it comes time to design these filters. And they're actually kind of fun and interesting to use. All right, now I'm going to try to pan out here and show you how I have the test set up, set up here right now. Let's see, we'll go back out here. And over here, you see I have my trusty audio waveform generator from Maplin. And it's putting out about a 1kc signal going into the mic jack, through the microphone amplifier, through the carrier oscillator balanced uh, modulator mixer here through the TIA amp, through the 10 pole crystal filter, other TIA amp, and that gets us to where we're going to talk, what we're going to talk about now, and that is what happens around the ADE1 mixer. You can see I've got it here. There's the ADE1 mixer. Here's the SSB signal coming in. Here's the 9 megahertz VFO. Right now I have it set up. We're going to take a look at 75 meters, and I'm going to show you what the output looks like on the scope. So let me go back over here. We pan up so we can see both the scope and the device that should do it right there all right this one this one i think is really kind of fun first let me make sure i'm in a position here where you guys can see all right first i'm going to put the scope probe right at the output of the filters you can see it's going right here look boom that's a nice pretty sine wave right that's pretty much what you'd expect and it's at a very low power level it's right now at, it's a 91 millivolts across 50 ohms, but that's because I haven't really even started the RF amplification process. All right, so now we're looking at this filter here. This is the 75 meter filter. What's interesting to me is what happens when you look at the input to the filter. Um, recall that the ADE1 mixer, which is here, is uh, a diode ring mixer. So it's multiplying by ones and negative ones, and it's really chopping the signal up and that's how it comes up through the Fourier transform with the sum and the difference frequencies. So at the, when, 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 at the output of this mixer, we should see you know, all that multiplication of one and negative one. This is something that Alan Wolke and W2AEW showed us how to take a look at a while back. And I, I did it, it was really quite fun because you could see, you could almost see the waveform, the complex waveform forming that would have within it the sum and the difference frequencies and a lot of other frequencies too. So the job of this filter really is to get rid of all those frequencies that you don't want and keep the one that you do want. Let's take a look at the input to the filter. Look at that. You could almost see the, the oh, let me make good contact there. You could almost see the sums and the differences, all the different, there's a complex waveform coming out there. And when you look at kind of a, chart representation of how uh, a diode ring mixer works. Oh, let me get a good contact there, hold on. That's pretty much what you see. So that's sort of the classic straight up output of the mixer. And it goes through the filter and at the other end you get, boom. <laughs> the filter is working. All right, and that's what you want. Now we're ready to put that signal through the RF amplifier that I'll build over here. This has been a kind of fun and educational uh, process, and I hope you guys are uh, are enjoying it as much as I am. Uh, I kind of like the alfresco, uh, semi-alfresco, alfresco, but with an evolving box kind of structure of this whole thing. And it really is fun to kind of go through it stage by stage and, uh, and 
kind of make sure each one is doing what you're what it's supposed to be doing using even the limited test gear that I have here. The the Nano VNA really helps. The Antuino really helps. The AADE LC uh, meter helps. Of course, the Rigol scope. All of it. You know the HP signal generator. Um, I've been having a lot of fun with this project. All right, I'll uh, I'll. I'm not sure what I'll cover in the next topic. I might I might start building the RF amplifiers for the uh, for the transmitter. For now, a seven three from Northern Virginia.